there's a story coming out of Michigan that I wanted to make sure to get in the show because this is actually quite extraordinary from a historic perspective. Um, put this up on the screen. So the Michigan legislature has now rolled back, voted to repeal the state's right to work law. That's of course an anti-union law yesterday. Since that law was originally passed back in 2012, Michigan has lost roughly 40,000 union members. I don't know if you remember uh, 2012 saga, there were huge protests over this, Michigan being mm -hmm. one of the hotbeds of initial union activity. I mean, this is like the heart and soul of the labor movement. So when Rick Snyder and the Republicans passed this right to work legislation. It was a really big deal. Part of why this is so extraordinary is because let's put the map that we have up on the screen. There were at least, now there's 26, there were 27 states, and this has to be officially signed into law, et cetera, but there were 27 states that had passed right to work legislation. This is the first time in 60 years that a state has actually voted to go in the other direction and repeal right to work. Now, there have been some encouraging signs in terms of a growing labor movement. Of course, we've covered extensively the grassroots efforts at Starbucks, at Amazon, REI, other workplaces. Um, you also have you know, public support for unions at near record highs. The numbers still continue to be extraordinarily grim, though, in terms of overall union density. You continue to sort of have that uh, eroded and eaten away. But this is another hopeful sign that things politically, the winds have really politically shifted because, you know, even the, Vir the Virginia legislature is a good example to contrast here. So the Virginia legislature's Democrats had, you know, they had the House, they had the Senate, they had the governor under Ralph Northam in the previous session, and they didn't bother to repeal right to work. They didn't even really talk about repealing right to work. Now, Michigan is a different state that's not so suburban centric, but I even think just between that time and now, labor issues have come more to the forefront, and Democrats have stopped just caving to Republicans or actively helping them in crushing unions and are now starting to push in the opposite direction. So I think it's a, well, it's quite a turning point. I think it's because, frankly, of pressure from the amount of union votes that were starting to go to Republicans. And Michigan just came off that big victory for Democrats in the midterm elections. But we shouldn't recall or we shouldn't forget that Trump won Michigan in 2016. He barely mm -hmm. lost it in 2020. So if you want to make sure that you're going to keep some of that union vote and actually keep the state from being competitive, you need to shore up every single constituency for what you got. So it's actually not a bad thing, really, that they did it. But that's one of the other, you know, they're capitalizing on the gains that they made based on the Roe versus Wade decision and then trying to cement it with some of the economic ones, specifically because we saw so much union vote go to Trump in 2016. So I look at this as a smart, savvy move on the yeah. Democrats' part. Uh, if they did it more nationally, they would do more, they would do better in elections. Right. Well, this is what was always so idiotic about them, yeah. either a ban the labor movement or actively partnering with Republicans to crush it is that for them, just from a, a political strategy perspective, it was absolutely idiotic. Um, this is the first time in 40 years that Democrats have held the House and the Senate in Michigan. So this was a, a really unusual opportunity presented to them by the combination of, you know, Roe versus Wade and also some of the like stop the steal insanity that people just viscerally rejected. It was a party line vote in the state Senate. So you had 20 Democrats and 17 Republicans vote against. And um, the House voted already to pass the law last week. Now they've got to sign off on the final language and then it'll go to Gretchen Whitmer's desk to sign. But it, it was interesting of a sign of the times of, for, you know, in my opinion, of Democrats changing their view of what's politically strategic for them. And also, I think you also have to say the success of these grassroots movements has also really put pressure on legislators to back up some of their words with real action. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And uh, it is an extraordinary move. It also, what I'm curious is to see if Republicans, they, I'm not going to say they're going to start repealing it. I wonder, though, if anybody's going to keep running on it the way that the Scott Walkers of the world and others did, specifically in these types of states. I mean, they would just be fools to do so. Even Trump as well, I'd be very curious to see where, you know, he may appoint a, a non-labor friendly NLRB, but I'd be curious to see, like, if he was asked directly about it, 
what he would actually say. Mm -hmm. Because something tells me that the winds are shifting, and I think this is just the forefront of that fight. Hey, guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.